soon. Okay, everybody. Well, we're here on the teacher's lounge and we are live. We're going to have a few te teachers drop jumping in and out of the lounge as we go. Tonight, we have Thomas Cermak and Paul Lucas, both are experts in their own right, and they have just an incredible amount of ability to educate all of us and tell us what we would do and not do. And then I'm going to go over the mystery of the hydro force. And then of course, we're gonna open things up to questions. For all of you watching live on Facebook, I see that we have nine viewers currently right now. I wanna thank you guys so much and thank you for allowing us to serve you. And you know, when you're out in your day-to-day -day life, hi there, how you doing? Um, when you're out in your day-to-day -day life, make sure that you make the effort to thank those that are serving you each and every day. Take that effort, no matter who they are. And um, why don't we start out, Aaron? by the first what would you do segment and thomas and paul and i can go ahead and go over that okay okay so <laughs> that looks like a jute rug if i've ever seen it um it looks like paul's having to get up close can you blow that up a little bit aaron somehow I no no i i reckon I recognize it. Yeah. Hopefully that doesn't make any of us throw up because I know when I see jute, it makes me feel a little Ill, Ill on the inside. So, Paul, I have to ask, as the as an industry-leading uh, fine fabric specialist, what would you do? Okay, well, I've seen some um, kind of negative talk about this, uh, uh, being that they were afraid of the uh, jute or whatever that uh, cellulosic material is. And then it appears to be, of course, we're not really testing and, and I'm only looking at a picture, but it, it appears to be wool and, uh, and cellulose. So a lot of negative comments, but I have customers that do these types of rugs every day of the week and all over the country. So what I see this, especially if it's installed wall to wall, a customer has bought something for whatever reason. Maybe they just love it. Uh, maybe they want natural things in their home. Maybe they don't like synthetic things. Whatever the case, these people have a potential disaster on their hands because this rug is going to be very, or this carpeting, uh, is going to be very difficult to clean. So now all you need to find is somebody that knows what they're doing. So I suggested to make this uh, off the customer a maintenance program on this rock because it's going to need regular maintenance. And depending on how often they use the room, how many people are using it, do they have kids, do they have pets, you know, how, how much cooking, how much how much activity on this rug, it needs to probably be, be done every every season, every three months. Uh, if it's a, a lesser amount of activity, you know, maybe every six months. So what we have to figure those things out. But this rug needs to be meticulously vacuumed uh, for dry soil removal. And then you need to use a, a product like Silver Solution, or something similar, but I don't think you're going to find that out there in the world. But um, you're going to need to have something that's not going to leave a soil attracting residue. Uh, you don't want to use any alcohol uh, on this wool. So you want to keep it uh, neutral or slightly acid for that reason. And you don't want to get this rug super wet. So you're going to want to, uh, want to put on a low moisture type system. And because when you look at that wool, and you look at all those fibers, that's kind of a, a large denier yarn. And wool's a staple fiber. So you're going to get a lot of uh, linting and shedding if you get aggressive with this. So I would think a light misting with silver solution and then either um, hand towel it or use some kind of... Um, pad system with you know low speed uh, 
uh, low weight agitation. And you can even do it by hand. And then, of course, this textile is going to need fiber protector. So I look at this as being at least $1 a square foot. And I look at fiber protection as being $1 a square foot. Because this is not synthetic. It's going, it's going to drink That's up. More of it, yeah. Mm -hmm. It's going to drink up your, your fiber protector. So I would go with solvent-based fluorocarbon. And I'd love to see this as a maintenance contract. And then you can say to that buyer, hey, you bought what you liked. You bought something unique. Uh, and you can keep it for years, and it'll look good for years if I maintain it on a regular basis. I, I of course, am biased and 100% agree with you. Uh, I would use them. I would actually avoid even using microfiber. I know microfiber is the most popular thing to use. I would probably, I'm going to say the T word. <coughs> I got to say it. I would probably block, I would use a, Terry cloth towel, terry cloth bonnet, lightly mist it, clean it, and around the edges and any area that has trafficking at all, I would give it a light, not pounding the snot out of it, a light tamping pressure, trying to blot it out if there's any spots or spills anywhere. But I would avoid any form of agitation where you're rubbing in a pattern. If you look at the rug carefully, you can see that there's a pattern to it. And I would want to go directionally with that pattern in order to keep those loops from breaking loose. Um, it looks like Josh is in the lounge right now. He is out working right now at a Golden Corral. And it looks like Kevin's on as well. Um, Thomas, what would you do in this case? And Robert Quinn also joined us. Well, there's a lot of different ways you could approach this. I like the idea of Silver Solution. I like, of course, you know, Tom likes tamping. Something I've done on something, not the same rug, but a, a similar difficulty was I took a lamb's wool T-bar on a pole and I actually missed it, not Silver Solution, but the closest product I had it to it at the time. And I actually used that T-pole with the lamb's wool cover and did it by hand very gently to minimize the aggressiveness and moisture and I've actually done them by hand, but using, it was actually the T-poles, like you use the window uh, scrubbers, you know, kind of thing, the lamb's wool ones. And it worked really well. It was very minimally aggressive, mm -hmm. and uh, it worked pretty well for me. I, I do like tamping. You can't really tamp much with the lamb's wool T-bar. You can a little, but not a whole lot. But it did make it where I could do a larger area without getting too aggressive and felting it or causing any problems. So, you know, I enjoy doing it that way. I, I'd be afraid to get too aggressive on it, just like you're saying, with the denier of the yarn. And, you know, I, I mean, I agree with everything that was said by both you and Paul. I might try the T-handle as the maintenance in between, mm -hmm. just because it's easier than going around and doing it by hand, like with a towel in my hand kind of thing. But, Absolutely. you know, I, I like the T-bars. I have found on a lot of very delicate fibers where I want to do a hand cleaning, even on some silk pieces I've done, I have used the T-bars with great success. That's a great tip, Tom, and I appreciate that. It's, um, you know, so needless to say, if you run into a jute fiber, um, we can help you out. And, Paul, do you have something you want to share? Uh, and I know nobody's going to believe this. Uh, but I'm going to say it anyways because it's true. <laughs> you can actually take silver solution and put it on a rug and work it with a, a towel or, or some other absorbent material. And you can just leave it in there. Yeah. And it won't cause resoiling. You can, you can vacuum the vacuuming during the regular house maintenance, the once a week vacuuming or whatever they do, will take care of the soil. So you don't have to worry about getting this rug extremely wet. A absolutely. You know, that, that that's a, so you could use a T-bar with a foam bucket and some silver solution and go to town. So, you know, that's a great, we came up with a solution for it. So now let's move on to our next, what would you do segment? Aaron, can you pop that up and on the screen? Okay, this was Bob Foster. Um, Aaron, will you go ahead and read that to us, if you don't mind? Okay. Sure. We got uh, it says big bad hydrogen peroxide. 
Protein helixes be damned. It looks really good. I say, why the heck not? To almost everything I clean, I go through a case of 40 vol a month. Never a problem and always better than pulling down the browns and illuminating the lights and brights. Tell me one place you wouldn't use it. I got no time for 3%. Only 3% goes on delicate stuff. Wool gets nailed. Peroxide is the secret sauce in a lot of stuff we use. Never, ever ruined or damaged anything. So tell me why I shouldn't use it. Wow. Well, my head's about to catch on fire on that one. But um, Paul, <laughs> please embrace us with the knowledge of a person that understands why we shouldn't use aggressive peroxide. <laughs> Um, can everybody hear me? It was a little muddled. Okay. So, Paul, can you please um, share with us what about the peroxide and what you would um, advise in this scenario where somebody's wanting to use 40 volume all the time peroxide? Okay. Well, uh, oxidation it is inherently destructive. And what oxidation is really doing is it's uh, going into the material that you that you have and it is stealing electrons. So you're losing your material. Now, if you're trying to remove a stain, uh, like a coffee stain, well, that's great because if you go in there and steal the electrons from that uh, color, from that chromoform, you, you'll eventually break it and then you don't see that color anymore because it doesn't function as a chromophore. So you've destroyed that color, which is what you were after. And that's what you want to do. Now, on synthetic fibers, they're very resistant to oxidation. So, you know, you can use uh, oxidation on your synthetic fibers and they can, they, they're prepared to withstand it, even nylon. Okay, now, but the trouble with nylon is nylon has dye sites. So at the end of the polymer, that's what a dye site is, is your end group. So at the end of your polymer, you have your dye attached. And if oxygen gets to that, oxidation gets to that, then it can start stealing the electrons out of that die and even on nylon carpet you can destroy the color and have a color loss situation because the dye site is there with and if it's a uh, oxidizable dye which most of them are you you can take the color out but really what's important is natural fibers because natural fibers are not really resistant uh, to oxidation and especially the case is with cotton and other cellulosic material. Because cellulose is a very simple polymer. It's sugar molecules. that are bonded to each other with a reduction bond. And then once they become bonded, the sugar molecules become insoluble in water. So you have a waterproof material, which is great. So that's why we have cotton clothes, cotton jeans, T-shirts, cotton socks. Okay, it's great. But because it's a reduction bond and you go in there with oxidation, you begin to depolymerize the, the cotton or the other or cellulose to the point that it becomes dust, becomes insoluble. So even an application of 3% is inherently destructive. Now, the reason you get away with it is because there's millions and millions of these bonds in, in a cotton textile. But nonetheless, you're still destroying them. So you, you have to watch how far am I going? Mm -hmm. So another good analogy for oxidation is is heat okay so if we want to heat something or let's say even if we want to cook something there's a big difference from cooking at a thousand degrees 
than there is at cooking at 500, than there is at cooking at 250, than there is at cooking at 125. So when you take you take 3% hydroperoxide, that's kind of like a slow cooker. It's a, it's a very controlled um, chemical reaction. But you go to 6%, and that's like taking that, that 125 and going to 250. Okay, and, and you go to 9%, it's like going up to 500. And you go to 12%, it's like going up to 1,000. Okay, so now it becomes hard to control, and you start to get way too much destructiveness. Now, <clears throat> I didn't look this up ahead of time, but, um, you know, if you get up there with hydroperoxide up there, and I forget what the number is, but, you know, 18%, 20%, it will literally turn your cotton to dust. I mean, you could put it on one time and then let it dry. And then when you go to vacuum it, it all just disintegrates. So the point yeah. I'm moving here, I want to make one, one point about how real this is. If you're a rug cleaning company and you get you get dozens of rugs in a, a day or a week or more, one of the things you do during pre-inspection, because you need to pre-inspect every handmade rug that comes in, you know, you just you have to. Um, so one of the tests is to grab the cotton fringe by its tip and tug on it. And often, I mean way too often. You tug on the end of that fringe, a whole bunch of fiber comes between your fingers. And you just let it fall to the ground. And you tug, and it just comes out everywhere. That is proof of oxidation. Somebody has depolymerized that cotton. And it's really often, I mean, it's at least half your rugs. Then you get a rug that has not been bleached. And then when I say bleach, I mean oxidation. Uh, could be 3%, 6%, 12%. Could be chlorine bleach. When you tug on those fibers, they, it comes apart. If it's not been oxidized, you tug on those cotton uh, yarns, and they're tough. I mean, you have a hard time breaking one. I mean, you have to pull hard enough. If you want, it feels like you're going to cut your finger off. That's how strong cotton is if it hasn't been oxidized. And so this is something that so many cleaners will clean an oriental rug or, you know, handmade rug, and they'll see that fringe, and the fringe doesn't look white. You know, it looks ivory, or it looks maybe it browned a little bit. Maybe it's on, it got a little color that bled from the, the pile of the rug. So what they do is they go use strong hydroperoxide, like 12%, 6%, or they make chlorine bleach up, and they mix it real weak, and they apply that to it. And the fringe looks beautiful. So then they say to their customer, hey, you know, I cleaned your rug. It's great. Oh, and the fringe needed some extra work. So I'm going to have to charge you for whitening your fringes and cleaning your fringes, you know, another two bucks a square foot or whatever. And the, the customer's happy because the fringe looks beautiful. They collect their money. But really, they ruin that lady's rug. Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah. so oxidation, yeah. even though I might say, well, I, I use it all the time. I never see any damage. The fact is you're damaging and you just don't know it because you don't really, you don't really see the effect until next time you try to clean it. And then the effect is there. And I mean, this happens every day in every rug cleaning plant. It happens all the time. Yeah, I, I absolutely have seen this firsthand where a rug was damaged through peroxide. I've actually seen it to where the peroxide has gotten in the rug deep enough. And keep in mind, this is fine rugs. Um, seen it where it's gotten in and just damaged the threading in the rug to where the the, the, the backing has actually started to come out where it's like, oh, um, I might... My brain's not working right now, but where, where it's a tapestry and they've inserted Let's fibers. Move. Yeah, and it's just coming all apart. <laughs> and it's like literally coming apart in my hand. And the thing is, the wool wasn't damaged, but the backing was destroyed. And it's just, it, it's so sad when we see that happen. But we actually, we got to keep track of time. We got to look to our next, what would you do? Uh, okay, maybe we, but that's yeah. also true. It's also true with upholstery. 
Okay. Absolutely. I mean, you know, so it's not, we're not just talking about rugs, but that's a good example of where it's really a common problem. And so, and the other people, all those guys don't really know what we're talking about. But if you get the women talking, they know oh, what yeah. they're doing laundry because your underwear, your socks, your T-shirts, your blue jeans, if they oxidize on a regular basis to get their, their whites white, you know, their underwear white, they're, they're, the cotton falls apart in no time. And you're out buying Absolutely. new garments because they won't withstand that oxidation over and over again. No, they won't. So we got to move on to the what next, what would you do? And this is a really good one. Um, and I know uh, it was Samuel Perry with the uh, pet urine. Um, we went back one. Uh, there we go. So Samuel Perry, he had a really neat rug with a, a ton of cat urine on it. And I wanted to address this. And Samuel is one of the best cleaners in our industry. I'm, I really like what Sam does. And um, he was wondering what he would do to treat this rug. And, you know, honestly, if I look at that heavy a damage and I peel back a rug, I'm going to recommend replacement here regardless. <laughs> Uh, I, I do have an excellent product it's called Obliterate. I would use it on it. There's tons of enzymatic products, but there, there is a time where there's a point of no return and being honest with your customer saves you from liability, no matter what the pad needs replaced. And obviously that's what he's doing. He's pulling pad. Um, I was really curious in a commercial marketplace, we had really run into this, but we do have both um, Robert Quinn, is up here and he does do some commercial cleanups that are pretty darn nasty. I'll be interested in what his thoughts would be on that. So I just had a good afternoon. Good evening, everybody. By good the way, evening, sorry, I was, sorry, I was a little late. I had some, some church function tonight and I got done with it and flew home. <laughs> um, so we had a situation similar to this in a Fairfield by Marriott uh about four months ago uh the lady checked in on sunday had two full-grown german shepherds checked in on sunday checked out the following saturday was there six days the dogs never left the room two full-grown german shepherds in a hotel room for six days wow imagine the smell when they left so they called us in and it was, it was bad. And I mean, I, I, I black lighted it, but the whole room was just, the whole room was glowing. It looked like, you know, nuclear, a nuclear bomb had went off. Everything was <laughs> glowing and she's, you know, can we fix this? Can we save the carpet? Can we save the carpet? Um, pulled it back and I've, I've got some pictures of it and I, I pulled it back and it was just, it was, it was like this, this edge on this top picture but throughout the whole carpet, except for where the bed was. Wow. Um, I mean, it was just everywhere. So in that instance, I, I told her, you know, that absolutely the, the, the best way uh, to get rid of this, and you've got, you know, it, it's, it's carpet with uh, the foam backing glued to it, commercial glue down uh, with the foam backing glued to it on a concrete slab. So mm -hmm. we did, uh, we did a, we pulled all the carpet, we emptied the room out, got a dumpster, emptied the room out, all the furniture went in the dumpster, all the carpet went in the dumpster, um, and we did a urine treatment on the, on the concrete itself, let it set, soaked it down, let it set two hours, soaked it down again, let it set two hours, rinsed it, soaked it down again, let it set two hours. <laughs> You know, undoes yeah. it. I, I used undoes it with you know plastic. Put plastic over top of it. Uh, got it to a point where it wasn't. It wasn't foaming as bad, but it, it was starting to get to a point where the the GM was saying, you know, well, how much is this going to cost? And at this point, we were three days in and about forty two hundred bucks. At this point, wow. and, you know, they still had twenty five grand worth of furnishings to put back in the room. So. You know, I said, look, this we're we're at about our part where it's got where it's stopping the foam. Um, so what I would recommend to do is go ahead and rinse it one more time, seal it, seal the concrete, and roll the dice and 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 hopefully, you know, shoot for the shoot for the stars. And hopefully that'll work. Um, and it worked. Long story short, yeah. it so 
in a situation like this, and I, I know Sam, and I, I, I actually had the privilege to, to, to spend a couple of days with him just two weeks ago. And uh, in this situation for me personally, and this is just my, my, my business model, um, I, I wouldn't have went through all that. Me I neither. Went through all of that, all that, all that carpet and padding, all of it would have came up. Now we would have treated the subfloor, but as far mm -hmm. as treating the, the the carpet and the and the padding, never happened. Yeah, uh, I, I've learned... I respect him. He did a he did a hell of a job. Got it done and oh. got it cleaned. Uh, but you know, yeah. but for me, it's just too much liability. Yeah, Mister Liability. Uh, <laughs> I'm gonna make you a T-shirt, Super <laughs> Liability Man. We'll have to like <laughs> take it off. It'll be a whole super suit thing. It'll be amazing. Absolutely. Um, because let's face it, we're in business to make money and you're not making money in that situation. You're only making money for the time you can charge. And in this case, it's, it's a difficult way to charge, to make income for that. And I, I know, like, I don't know if Kevin can chime in, but he's in hospital environments all the time and we'll run into stuff where it, the option is to get rid of it. The option isn't to save it. Um, there's different levels of remediation. Oh, it looks like Kevin unmuted himself. Maybe he would like to chime in. Yeah, when we're talking about true disinfection and not just covering up, um, not just getting areas sanitized, um, there's times that you just have to remove what's there and, and start over. Um, there was a recent foot call that Tim and I both got um, you know, and they wanted to save the carpet and we both just told them you, you can't, it's impossible. You cannot save this carpet. You've had sewage in it. It's in places that it can never be cleaned. And you're just setting yourself up for litigation if you don't do this. And that's where a lot of that level of professionalism comes in where customers will respect that when you tell them this is this is how it has to go in order for things to be truly clean, disinfected, and safe for people to be in that area or live in that area. And if you have somebody that is unreasonable and doesn't like that answer, then you don't want them as your customer anyway. So there's a lot of times that we run into things in, in the medical settings where I just have to tell people what you're asking for is impossible. We have to do something different. And then we'll figure out a way to do it from there. Yeah. In fact, right now I just popped up a YouTube um, uh, on Facebook. We just had a comment. I know a contractor got drug into a lawsuit, cost him $100,000 to get released. Um, th that's what happens. And Mr. Robert Quinn's losing his mind because he's Mr. Liability. But that's what happens to us. When you take on something you should not take on, you kill your business. You kill your family, you kill your livelihood, and you kill your time because time is money. And speaking of time, we should probably move on to our next thing. I don't know if we have another what would you do or where it's time. Oh, this one I wanted to talk about. It was interesting because he used the term, that guys, um, for this suede cotton, which I've never heard of. Um, how would he clean it? Now, I would use... I would use the dry, I would use a foam technique with silver solution on mix up a slurry, make a foam, sponge it down. Um, but I have a feeling that there would be a more appropriate product, um, that you could get through Paul probably for cleaning this high end cotton. Because that can we blow that up a little bit, Aaron? It looks like a very high end piece. I mean, that is an expensive sofa, and this would not be something somebody would want to touch without being an upholstery expert, in my opinion. I'm um, out. This, yeah. I'm out on that one. I'm out. <laughs> Robert's already out. <laughs> um, <laughs> Thomas or, or Paul, which one of you would be willing to clean this one? And what would you do? Paul. Okay. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, like everything, there's more than one way to do stuff. But... Um, Suede and, and uh, cotton are two, two very different things. So it may have both of them on there, but you, you'd have to use two different methods if it's both suede and cotton. You know, suede meaning leather, split leather. 
Uh, but if it's cotton, um, it looks to me on the right hand side that there's a lot of discoloration. Yep. Which I'm assuming that uh, the dog sleeps there or yep. stays there. So what that's going to do is cause a lot of body oils from the dog. Now it could be somebody else. It could be you know, you know, Mister Homeowner. And maybe he just sits there and sweats all day. I don't know. But there's body oil probably. So, and I don't want to do an upholstery class, but, you know, dry soil removal. And then once you've got that done, you have to attack that oil. So normally we would spray that with a dry cleaning solvent of some type uh, that doesn't have any water in it. And then what that will do is that will take those solids, that, that oxidized oil, and turn it back into a liquid. And then I would probably towel that to remove some soil. But but the point is you made the oily residue uh, liquid. And now you can clean away. If you don't do that step, when you're all done, it's still going to be there. So you mm -hmm. have to liquefy that, that body oil, or, or whatever that is. Okay, and then, uh, if you remember back in the old days, we, had a, we used to have a product called a uh, Haitian uh, cotton cleaner. A bunch of different companies made that. So you either need to find that uh, or uh, we make a product like that. Uh, you clean that piece. Uh, I would probably use foam and foam it up and then apply the foam and then on, you know what that, that fabric test. you got to test your fabric, but look at the back and all those kind of things. What's it stuffed with? You know, make all the decisions during your pre-inspection. But basically, I would foam it up, uh, w work it in a little bit, activation, and then I would either vacuum only extract or I would rinse it, uh, extract and rinse, depending on, you know, how tough the fabric is and all that. And then I would um, towel dry the area, and then I would speed dry uh, with air movement uh, the whole piece. But, but those are the things you're up against. And, of course, if there's leather on it, then you have to clean that in a totally different way. A absolutely, Paul. Thank you so much for sharing that. That's okay. That's exactly what I was going to say. And the we actually have to – go ahead, Tom. Sorry. Uh, the, only thing I, the only thing I want to mention on that is if you're using a Haitian cotton upholstery shampoo, <clears throat> most of those have reducers in them, the Haitian cotton. And if you speed dry them, you won't have – quite as good a brightening effect i find that you can actually vacuum extract and then towel through most remove most of it but you want to let it dry naturally to have the best brightening effect mm -hmm. Absolutely. Uh, i i agree with i agree with that but but my concern with that was on the left you seem to have a relatively clean sofa Absolutely. and on the other side you have a heavily Oh, yeah. That's why yeah, I so agree with that's the solvent cool. and everything, too. And I would think you'd need as much of the brightening effect as possible. That's why I was thinking I wouldn't probably speed dry it. I would do your solvent treatment to get the oils out. That's wonderful. But I would just, and everything you said, I would do, except I probably wouldn't speed dry it, only okay. because I'd want to get every ounce of whitening out of it I could to try to match that left side, because the left side looks like it's been covered the entire time or something. I agree. I agree with you. I think that's you. You added. Uh, you added much to that by by slow because you're absolutely right. That's uh, you want to. You want to. You don't want to drive so slow that you know you got problems from that. You know, from right. rusting right. Or the buttons or or anything like that. But you don't want to flash dry it because you need that reduction uh, right. to get time to work. Good, good. Good. Great point. Absolutely. Thank you guys so much for sharing on that part. Um, now it's time for us to move into the segment where I'm going to talk about the Hydro Force and about applying um, things. Uh, we're going to make it, can we make it to where it's like just me in that picture real quick? And um, so I can kind of point to the side or wherever it is it would be on this side. So <laughs> when we're dealing with a Hydro Force, a Hydro Force is this right here. For those of you that are really green, really new, you'll recognize these. Injection sprayer. Mine is beat to death. It's called an injection sprayer. That right there, what you see, 
is a cut in half what's known as a DEMA valve, okay? DEMA valves work through the Venturi effect. If um, you look at it, you can see over here, kind of, if you look through there, there's a really tiny orifice. And if you look, there's a triangle or a funnel that heads down toward through that orifice. And so it's heading through in that direction. The velocity of the water is what's siphoning through right here. So if you look at that diagram, then you can see. So the water's coming through on this side at a high velocity. It's going past that little orifice. And then it's siphoning up through there. And it's coming out this other side right here. Okay, the way it does that is through a low pressure system. Now, what happens is a lot of times people are like, how do you get this to be exact? Well, frankly, there's no way of making it exact. Every time you change the pressure on your truck, you'll need to recalibrate. Well, how do you calibrate? You literally have to fill your jug. You would take your jug, you would fill it up with an exact amount, whatever you calculate. Let's say that you put in one quart, okay? You put in one quart and you would see how long it would take at the given pressure you want to clean with in a jug, how fast it would go down. And that's how you would figure your ratio for your four to one or whatever. Now, a high, uh, an injection or inline sprayer looks like this, you know, when it's all in one piece. Mine's actually pretty neat. I got the Revolution, which is an adjustable one. But right here, you know, these always like to come off. And if there's a leak right here, you need to put a zip tie. I'll stop it. But underneath there, there's a little thing that gets screwed in. That little thing that gets screwed in is known as your tip. And you'll hear all the time the term 4 to 1 tip, 8 to 1 tip, 6 to 1, 32 to 1 tip. And all those different tips will change the orifice over here. If you look over here, you see that orifice. It'll change the opening at the bottom down here. Sorry, it's all left to right on me. Um, so it changed this opening. The smaller you make this opening, less water is going to come out or less siphon effect you're going to get. So that way you'll know what your DEMA is doing. Otherwise, the amount of demand or siphon that you'll have. Another thing that can affect that is this tip right here. It oftentimes is considerably overlooked. These will get wore out, they'll get beat up, and it will change. That's kind of why I like the unpopular, incredibly unpopular view of the adjustable one. The adjustable one, you can always change your ratio. I keep mine set at, right now I have it set at 6 to 1, but as it wears out, you can adjust it. Because what happens is, all those little points and all those little openings, as you spray, wear out. They all get larger. As all that changes, eventually what will happen is you won't have any siphon at all. You won't have any form of injection at all, and they stop working. And people are like, my hydro force wore out, or my injection sprayer wore out. And that's exactly what happens. They wear out in time. Another thing is, these are incredibly overused devices. If you need precision, this is not the tool for you. They're really not a precision instrument. There's no way of getting exact, exact every single time numbers to the letter. Every factor downstream will affect that. So the number of quick disconnects you have will affect it. The length of hose, if you're not running a continual hose run, can affect it. So the bucket technique is the only way to be 100% precise when it comes to that. So some tips when running your injection sprayer that's really helpful tips number one is get rid of the factory connector that comes right here um, mine's not set up like the factory the factory one has a standard brass open fitting that's very free flowing which is nice but i use the bucket technique to calculate how what what my sprayer is doing and i put on a standard quick disconnect just like I have on the rest of my truck. Then I can use this as a wash down tool for the rest of my instruments that I own. So like if I need to wash down my wand at the end of the job, I just simply take this and wash down my wand, my tools, my hoses, whatever I need to. 
Paul and I and the rest of the gang uh, here at the Teacher's Song, we actually did another episode where we talked about disinfecting our equipment and how important that is. Well, this is a good way of doing it. You can wash down everything you have because I can hook this up. And these are really good quality spray guns. You know, they hold a, you know, I think they're, yeah, they're 2,700 PSI rated, especially if you're buying a name brand sprayer, they can really handle it. And it's a standard truck mount quick disconnect. There's another advantage of doing that. When you change out to the standard truck mount quick disconnect, you carry a quick disconnect in your pocket, throw in another connector right here. You can add mixed up chemical into a bucket. Now you won't know precisely what it is because every time you change the orifice size, you'll get a different degree of siphon, but you can put chemical right into a bucket and use that for washing, which is pretty darn cool. Um, so another quick tip is I'll see guys run these without this filter from the factory. They come with a filter. I don't know what would possess somebody to run one without a filter, but that would be a bad choice because the second any of these little tiny orifices get clogged, they often think their hydro force is bad. Well, I totally forgot to grab them, but you can go to any welding supply and get reams for cutting torches and clean out all these orifices. You can just stick it in the end and clean them all out and it'll keep the venturi effect working for a long time in fact i only have to replace my sprayers every four or five years because i clean them out um in fact a lot of guys will say they rebuilt them well there's only so many o-rings there's an o-ring located right here there's a seal there's a seal right here and then there's a seal down here now mine's a little tight it's not wanting to come apart but anyways I'll go ahead and move on. Right here, underneath this cap right here, there's actually a spring and a check valve that goes right here. That spring and that check valve keeps the water from going up through here or back into the jug. So if you take out your spring and your check valve, what will happen is it will go back into your jug. So if you're losing chemical, if, chem if you go to let off this trigger, let's say you let off the trigger, and now your jug's filling up it's because your check valve your little check ball has gone out and your little spring's not there and little seal's not there so underneath this right here underneath this portion right here is where your spring and check valve is i wish i could have gotten that apart but i tightened it with my gorilla fingers and now they don't want to come apart um yeah still not want to come apart but actually i can show you right there there's where your metering tip goes um underneath this hose and I like these little clamps right here. You can get them from Amazon. The tighter you squeeze them, the tighter they get. And um, I also like replacing the hose if you have a bad hose. You know, keep your hose in order. And I actually like to use silicone hose because that holds up the best <laughs> the chemistry that we run into. So there's all sorts of little tips and tricks you can have with your hydro force. You never want to um, overlook them as a tool. But I think they're overrated that's my personal view i think they're very valuable i think that we all have them on our truck and we all use them each and every day but there's places you can't use them such as low moisture cleaning um cleaning upholstery and um all of that and you know if, if you use a hydro force on a regular basis it's important also to remember how you apply chemical with the hydro force when you apply chemical you want to be as even as possible Every time you let on and off the trigger, by the way, anytime you let on and off the trigger, a hydro force, what happens to a siphon is you lose a little siphon. So you're going to actually get a little surge of just water for a split second, and then you'll get chemical. They're not a precise tool. So, you know, I think um, they're a great tool for general carpet cleaning. They're a great tool for nasty work. Um, but, you know, that's my personal opinion. I think they're way overrated. They're way overloved. Um, I use them every, each and every day, that being said, because they're easy. But I would like to um, have other people, you know, in the in the comment section, make their comments about the Hydro Force. Robert, you have your hand up, and I would like to see what you have to say about it. Uh, so on, on the commercial side, so... We have, we've pretty much cycled out all hydrofors. 
we don't we don't even use them anymore. I mean, it's it's very very rarely we use them anymore. Um, it, it, the inconsistencies that come along with them when they wear out, you're you're not sure exactly how much you're putting down. It it it, it gets to be when you're when you're in commercial applications. And, and Tim, you know this to yourself. You know there's there's some specifically for myself in hospitality. Um, in rooms, you'll have one rooms that they're all, you know, they're all nylon or they're all synthetic. And then your corridors or your meeting rooms will be wall to wall wool. Mm -hmm. So you, you get into different situations. What I have found for me personally, this is my opinion. What I have found for me um, is when we're doing rooms, we use a four gallon battery backup backpack sprayer. I know what's being applied because we mix it in a jug, we mix it in a five gallon bucket, pour it in the sprayer. Um, the only time there's any difference differentiation is when the battery starts to drop down. Um, but when you when you got eight hour batteries, spend a little bit more on your batteries, get bigger batteries, they last a lot longer. Um, yeah. So the tips that are in there, the same thing with you know the metering tips that are in, you know the Hydroforce. On the end of your battery, on your on the end of your sprayer, you've got a yellow tip, a red tip, a blue tip. Those are different tips for four to one, eight to one, sixteen to one. You change the end of the tip, and it's consistent. It gives you a consistent pattern all the time. And for me, that's one of the biggest thing is I want consistency along with my production. Yeah, consistent results leads to happy customers. Happy customers lead to more customers. That's all there is to it. Absolutely. Um, um, does anybody else have anything to chime in with the Hydro Force? And if anybody wants to make any comments, they can start putting in questions in the chat section so we can go ahead and answer them toward the end of the show. Um, Thomas, I see you've got a bucket of parts like Thomas always does. Um, it looks like Thomas just disappeared on us. Well, he had a bucket of parts. Um, hopefully, he jumps back on. Um, Kevin, do you have something you would like to share? Yeah, we're all battery sprayers. The one that we're using, um, I'll have to put a video up of it. It is a handheld gun with a removable battery. And then there's a hose that runs from that. And you can run it pretty much into any jug that you want. So we're... Um, currently using um i think they're called u jugs so we can run five gallons of chemical i put it into a little tote and we can wheel that around and, and you can put it anywhere is that um a works is that a works kevin no it's not a works it's similar to that where it will build pressure um if you put a zero degree tip on it you can shoot it about 25 feet so we do use them um, um, on the window cleaning side, we'll, if we have some real small soft washing jobs that we have to do, we got some uh, mildew or uh, bio growth on some brick or some stone, spray that down with that. But when you put the fan tips in, then you're still getting a really good spray, but you're putting out between a gallon and a gallon and a half per minute. So you can we can, and there's a dial on it that allows you to turn down your pressure. So there's a short wand and a long wand. If I turn the pressure way down, put that short wand on, it's perfect for upholstery. You just just yeah. a nice light that's open out, turn it back up with a long wand. We can spray for VLM super quick, or if we're doing extraction, then we can, we can almost soak the carpet down and again, we're, we're getting a really, really good consistent spray and we're pre-mixing the juice. So everything is in the jug made up. Um, we have two different ones that we're using right now. And typically um, we're toggling back and forth between lightning and then a mixture of silver solution and thunder. And whichever one we want to go with, you just plug that in and you can, and you can go. So it has worked really well for us. There is another version of it that I'm working on getting one. Um, but again, I don't, I have a Hydroforce and I never use it. I, I, for me personally, I don't like unhooking the, the hoses. You know, yeah. shut the, 
shut the valve off, unhook your wand, hook the hydro force up, spray. I'm a big one for um, dwell time. So I want to have somebody behind me pre-spraying the area that we're hitting next and getting that agitated and ready for extraction. So I'm definitely one that's more for a, a battery sprayer. And again, these have removable batteries that charge in, I think, 45 minutes. So you can pull one off, put a new one on, and you're going. And by the time you would ever need a new one, you've got one already recharged. So it's it's been a great one for us. I'll have to take some pictures and video. We're using one tonight. Um, the crew is inside doing some floor work. And that's the other nice thing. We spray everything. We spray floors. We spray carpet. It doesn't matter what it is. We're not mopping anything on except for stripper if we're doing VCT. But everything else is a spray scrub spray vlm spray extract whatever it is and it just makes it so consistent absolutely i 100 awesome. agree with that kevin i i love the battery for vlm absolutely 100 yep. and it, it it for us as a company uh we're, we're all about production and we have time frames that we like you do kevin we have we have windows that we're allowed to be in like you know, checkout times at 11 o'clock, check-in time is four o'clock. We have five hours to get, you know, 60 rooms done. Yep. So production has to be, and, you know, unfortunately or fortunately, we've found the battery, the battery systems work a ton better. Now for residential, yeah. uh, for residential hydro forces, you know, pretty good, but for commercial applications, no. Yeah, I have yep. to agree with both of you for my commercial work. In hospital settings, I absolutely can't tolerate, and in, in doctor's office settings, I, I can't tolerate the possibility of uh, it not being dry in the morning. And with the inconsistency of the hydro force, like I, I have to have someone ahead of me spraying out so I can be then doing the low moisture pass and getting the air movers on it and getting to the next phase. But um, I see Thomas has set up a nice little table like Thomas always does because he's got all the little bits and pieces. Um, Thomas, would you like to share what you got there with your bag of goodies? Sure. Now, I agree with you that the electric, battery-powered, or plug-in are more precise in dilution. And I do not believe you should ever use a hydroforce on a pole street puts out too much water. We need to control our moisture in, do in order to control our outcome. But you were talking about the different tips. I thought I would show. Here's a gray tip, black tip, yellow tips. Actually, in this beam about here, it's actually a brown tip. And the brown tip is a 32 to 1, I believe. Uh, right. 32 to uh, uh, yeah. metering tip. So I like to use those. And this is the spring and ball you were talking about that goes inside the chest valve. And that and I was just wanting to show that, you know, for those who are not familiar with them, this is the back side of that cap, the DEMA mm -hmm. valve in the back side. And the spring would then go in here. Oops. If it doesn't fall out of my hands, the spring goes in here. Of course, it won't do it when I'm doing it with the wrong hand. So you put the spring in, then you put the ball in, it creates a check valve. And this is where your yellow tip or your blue tip or brown tip goes on here and screws on to the end. And then your draw tube goes on. This one here, I have a longer one and I don't have the handle on it like a hydro force. This is where we, uh, this is one of the tools I try to keep handy. So if you ever have a metering problem with your truck, as a temporary solution, you can hook in with a metering tip, the proper metering tip. If you're not getting dry, you can plug this right in line between your machine and your high pressure line and at least be able to get your acid rinse or whatever you're trying to do into the equation if you have the proper tip and the line. Well, we actually had someone on Facebook ask that very question, and I've done that very thing. I've used my hydro force as a rinsing device when my injection system is down on and it does work with a portable too the biggest thing with a portable is the volume you're you're it just doesn't have quite the flow um to maintain tip pressure through a hydro force unless you bump the pressure up so if you run it this way bump your pressure up now truck mount's going to be fine um but bump your pressure up on your portable 
Um, you can also use different meter, different valves, not that particular DEMA valve, but they have other valves that you can use like this one here that allow you to adjust it just by turning this valve here. They allow you to adjust it so you can get a better flow from it when you hook it into your portable. And then they have this one here also, which is an adjustable. You turn it to get it to adjust the flow so you can make sure you're getting some chemical draw with that lower pressure valve. You know, coming through that valve. So I just wanted yeah. to point out that I had some here. If anybody was wondering what the parts were, what you were talking about, because yours wouldn't open up, I figured I'd walk down here. And besides, Paul likes it when I walk down into my basement of plenty and start showing all these things off when he asks about them. <laughs> you guys with the most toys wins, and I, I think you're way out in front. You got lots uh, of no, I don't have the most toys at all. I just try to have a little bit of variety. And when people ask questions, I love being able to go and show them, you know, here, this is what it looks like. This is what you're looking for. This is how you fix it kind of thing. I just like being able to help people. That's all. <laughs> yeah, right right now, Kevin's wanting to show Robert the newest toy that Kevin's got. Kevin's yeah, I was, just, I was just looking at that. I'm like, what are you doing, Kevin? <laughs> yeah, so this is this is that <laughs> this Hello, is that sprayer. Hello, beautiful. <laughs> so I can I can adjust. There's a I don't do it too much unless I'm going to upholstery, but I can adjust the pressure here. And again, it has a removable battery. I put a coil hose on it that goes right to the premix, and then when we're doing the floors. Oh, wow. Beautiful. And it's also very quiet. So that's, that's the one of the thing things I dislike. The yeah, that's one of the things I dislike the most about, like, the work sprayer is it's a little bit loud. Um, so, you know, again, we're doing exam rooms tonight, so we'll end up moving all this stuff. But if I didn't want to move everything in here, I can still. And then I'll see if I can get a close up here. I mean, it, it puts out a decent amount of, of juice at, wow. at one pop. So, and then I just That's put impressive. this, I, I bought this cart. It'll actually go up steps, get a little zip tie for a tube, and this will just sit right down in there. And then that's yeah. that's how we're wheeling everything around. So that, we can... that looks though. Seriously, I mean, if we're if we're talking about you know professional looking, I mean, just on the surface, we all know what it is and what it does. But if you did not know what it was and what it did, what would your what would your take be on that? If you saw that in a hallway, you know, when you're walking down a hallway or whatever at a hotel, and you see a guy with that, what would you think? <coughs> You know, yeah, it definitely has I a would, professional look to it. I would be impressed myself. I would think that he has his own custom tools and is working really hard. Um, I wouldn't think that way if if I could go buy it at Home Depot. No, that's where that's where we got to be. You know, there's there's different viewpoints, and you know, people get all upset. I I personally love this tiny sprayer by Champion. Um, that's a one gallon pump up sprayer, and I love those things. And I keep all sorts of little mixes in my van. But the truth is, when a when a customer sees it, I know the whole time they're thinking that is a ten dollar pump up sprayer that he is applying. This fiber protectant, he's charging me three hundred dollars to put on my sofa. So the, <laughs> the best ones for me, and I know this is going to sound really cheesy, but I don't know of anybody else that makes a quality. You know, four gallon backpack pump or backpack operated. Uh, I'm sorry, Ryobi. They yeah. make, their their four gallon backpack sprayers are phenomenal. Uh, they're about 159 bucks, and I I spend the 12 bucks on an extra. You know, the extended warranty. About every four months, the seals go bad on it. It starts leaking. I take it back to Home Depot, get me a new one. But I I do I do brand it though. Him. I do yeah. come up Ryobi with Thorium stickers. I do. That brain. makes a big difference. <laughs> um, something that that I've liked recently is the Gentu sprayer. Kevin and I will have to get together sometime and do a video and see um, how that compares to the 
Gentoo sprayer because the Gentoo sprayer is something I use a lot. And that, that's a nice professional unit question. Nobody ever questions whether that is a residential purpose thing. Because in the sprayer marketplace, that's one of the things that gets really difficult is uh, does it look professional or not? And, um, you know, I actually just got a question in through Messenger. And I just asked them if it would be okay if I asked this. And seeing as how I have guys that work in the professional space, it would be really good. Um, the question is, what is the best way for me to build confidence within clientele while my crew is there um, without my presence? Say That's that again. Say that question. again, Tim. Okay. So which is the best way for me to build confidence with my clientele without my presence? with my crew there it's kind of phrased a little funny so basically he's wondering how he can build confidence with um hotel managers office managers without his presence robert please share very simple um one of one of one of the things that i market most to my clients is every single one of my employees follows the same procedures from start to finish, we are all take the same courses. And I know we've had kind of a little discussion about, you know, being trained and taking the courses, but I, I market that to my, to my clientele that every single one of my, every training that I take, my employees take the exact same training. And we try to, to the best of our ability, all the whole company take the same course at the same time so that we're all trained by the same person at the same time. Not everybody picks the same thing out of a training course. I might get something that one of my employees don't, and they may get something that I don't. Absolutely. So that is that uniform, that uniformity, and I'm talking about – from our office manager that answers the phone, myself, everybody in the company, we all take the same courses. We all take the train, same training. And it's a very open dialogue with employees. If they have questions, if they have something that they don't know, they'll reach out to me and say, hey, I don't know how to do this. And that's kind of one of the most important parts as far as my part or my role in the company is to make sure that everybody in this company knows that if they don't know something, they can call me or they can reach out or, you know, let the customer know that, you know, this is, this is an odd one for us. I don't exactly know how to do that. Let me talk to Robert and we'll see what happens. Yeah, absolutely. I, I do something very similar um, when I have it with, with our janitorial. I think that's what the question was leaning toward, but it'll apply to any cleaning business, any business. Uh, I actually make the effort to have the client meet my staff and get to know me with my staff. We'll pay for a company luncheon and we'll, we'll bring in cheap Philly cheesesteaks, make sure there's a vegan option. We'll make sure the whole office crew is getting served by my team. So my team will actually be standing behind like a buffet setting and introducing themselves and helping these people. Like we're hosting the event, but we're there at their site. And next thing you know, their entire um, staff members now equate us with quality and equate us as human beings. It Believe me, it makes any complaint you have when they see you as a human being is just now just taken down. The, the, Mr. Liability will appreciate the fact that that will eliminate lawsuit right there. They see you as a person. They love you as a person. They know you're a human being. They know our staff is a good person. They're not going to go after our staff. Another thing is you never, ever, ever throw a staff member under the bus. If they have an issue, it's with you. You are still the owner. You take ownership. Absolutely. Um, take that. You are the owner. Staff are trained. 
you train them. It's your fault they didn't follow your training, and you never berate a staff member in front of a customer. Ever, 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 ever. They are the most important, most valuable thing you have is your staff. Um, I do know Paul had his hand up a little earlier. Um, uh, yep. Okay. Yes, it was um, early, and I had a one-word answer was training. So it's all about training. Uh, and you guys brought, brought out some great points. But one of the things you want to make sure is the salesperson, the office staff, um, the cleaning crew, the owner, that they all speak the same story. You all sing the company song. And so part of your training is to have that go from top to bottom through everybody there so you all have the same story because i hear the opposite you know the the salesman says one thing the technician says another the girl on the phone said something different and that that makes people feel like they're not being handled properly there's something wrong but if yeah. you have that consistency through every layer of your company then that builds confidence yeah uh, Robert, you have your hand up. Real, real quick, Paul, I agree 100%. And that's kind of why I said, um, or that's not kind of why, it's the very reason that when we do training, the whole company does it at one time. That way, when uh, Kendra, our office manager, she, asks, she answers the phone and the customer asks her a question, she answers that question. And then the technician gets to the house and the, the customer asks them the same question. They answer it the same way. Everybody is uniform across the board from start to finish because i'm sorry to say it this way but this is the reality of it we're all business owners we know this people lie yeah and and from oh. all our facebook users oh. he said a very powerful statement people lie. um and yeah absolutely empower your staff <laughs> empower your staff um if you help your staff be not only feel like part of the team, but feel like they can handle anything. Um, it, it eliminates so many headaches. And I just think it was a beautiful, it's a beautiful statement. Um, another thing, like I had an experience tonight of a staff member that felt empowered to help. I called, I got, a, got myself a Bigby tonight, Bigby coffee. It was one of those cookie dough ones that, you know, nothing good for you in it, like terrible concoction um of just sugar <laughs> and i i wanted a little bit of a kick before i started there you go robert um and so there was plastic in it like i go to sip on the straw and there was a chunk of plastic it was about a half hour before the show and um i call her up i call up the big b and i'm like there's plastic in my thing and we ordered it through doordash and the lady was so apologetic she goes i'm incredibly sorry we don't know how that happens. We have no clue how that could happen. Um, the manager's not here, but I would like to give you a free coffee card and give you a free um, smooth, free, free whatever you choose. And I said, okay, well, I'll, I'll come and get that taken care of. And when I got there, um, she had my drink already ready and she had a gift card already ready. Now, I asked her, I said, so are you like the assistant manager? What position are you? And she goes, I'm a cat. I, I'm just a barista. So they've empowered anybody in their team to be able to make decisions that can benefit the client. And that's something like that we all can do when we make our staff feel like they can benefit the client. Um, it makes our whole company just amazing and it makes the, the, the customers will feel better the the staff will feel good about working for you um it looks like josh can actually say some words he's done steam cleaning <laughs> josh would like to say something how you doing tonight josh oh doing good just finished up it's raining like crazy so i gotta drive two hours in some rain which is no big deal but <laughs> <laughs> how was the yeah. building for all tonight it was good. We got her done. Um, yeah. Knocked her out in about two hours. About an hour. And, yeah, about an hour. And wow. Half. Robert and I both 
give me props for that. Now it looks like you were using just a regular old wand. Um, yeah. He, he talk, well, I'm our, sure you our, heard our conversation. Go ahead. No, I did a partial cleaning tonight, just the traffic ways. So it wasn't the whole thing. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah. Um, now, do you like to use the zipper on those, or do you like to use just the wand? Uh, it all depends what mood I'm in. But usually yeah. the zip is the best. <laughs> but tonight, you know, with going straight in, I just decided to do the wand. So Grab the wand. Without a helper, yeah. I find the zipper a little difficult myself. Um, I don't currently own a zipper because I don't have a helper with me very often. And yeah. I found you can also walk backwards with a wand. Um, that sounds terrible. There's people wanting to vomit by that very statement. But it works fine. Just go back up. I don't. You can shame, shame, shame me all you want. <laughs> Robert's, Robert's getting all emotional. <laughs> Carpet cleaning doesn't need to be rocket surgery. And, you know, <laughs> people overthink this to such an extreme. It is just getting the fibers rinsed and the fibers cleaned. And um, sometimes low soil conditions can get away with what you need to do to get away with it. But, um, you know, we were talking about the Hydro Force tonight. Did you use a Hydro Force to pre-spray tonight, Josh? Yes, I did. Yes, you did. Awesome. Awesome. I, I hope everything went well for you. Um, is there anything you would like to share before we wrap things up? No. Um, just excited about our group going. Oh, yeah. And, uh, Let's talk about the new group. We got about three minutes left. Um would you like to talk about the new group about commercial cleaning? Yeah, we're just uh, starting a new group, to, uh, and it's going to be a little more educational. Um, we've felt the need to do that. Uh, mm -hmm. We got Robert Quinn, Sam, and Thomas Cermak, and a and a bunch of people on there as uh, admins, and uh, we wanted it to be more panel type setting uh, where it's more educational. Um, we're going to do like a uh, book study, business book study, have more panels kind of like this and uh, have individual interviews with uh, different professionals in the industry and uh, kind of like what you guys are doing right now, but in more individual people. But uh, and we've got a lot of we want to also incorporate janitorial into it because we got a lot to learn from them and uh, connect as far as networking with janitorial because sometimes janitorial needs a deep clean on their carpets and such um, mm -hmm. so we can help each other on that and uh, but yeah that's kind of the vision uh, major learning type education uh, page so it, it's going to be a lot of fun. Um, I'm really looking forward to being able to share uh, my years of experience in janitorial. I know Kevin will be involved to a little extent on the janitorial side. He ran a very large janitorial business. Um, Robert has a lot to share. He's an admin in the group. And I'm super excited when it comes to the education side and the book side. Um, the, one, of the, one of the biggest things for me, Tom, or Tim, and Josh, both of you guys, uh, one one of the biggest things for me is the is the education side, mm -hmm. because we all we all know we're all in most of the other groups. There's 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 a ton of groups out there, and everybody's the same. Who is the best one? Who is the best pre spray? Where, where can I get this for the best price? There's no really talking about the business side of things, and that's that's yes. what I am literally. And this has nothing to do with the group as a whole because I'm an admin of it, but for me personally as a business owner, I am longing, literally longing to speak to other business owners about how I can make my business better on the business side. Yeah. Not on the cleaning side, on the business side. I, I have to agree with you there. It, 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 getting other people to talk about paperwork is sometimes very difficult because they don't want to talk about which form and how much they can draw on an S corp account versus on a LLC. Everybody wants to show their numbers. What I made today. Yeah. Okay. How much did you keep? Mm -hmm. That's what I want to see. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> how much and of that thousand dollars did you take today? How much did you put that in your tax account? 
How much did you put right. in your unemployment account? How much did you put in your operating account? How much did you put in your savings account? Mm -hmm. That's what I want to know. <laughs> Those are the most, the, the fact is, is um, a lot of groups shun even the very mention of investing and um, setting aside money for your future. But the reason we're able to sit here and not stress over the work tomorrow is because we're all business people. We've all taken our businesses seriously. How to dare a you cuss me like that, Tim? <laughs> <laughs> On another note, we also wanted to address like the health aspect of being a business oh, owner. Absolutely. Uh, mental health, physical health. Um, yes. I've been up, going to the library and checking out different things. One of the biggest difficulties for a business owner is staying positive because you got your ups and your downs. And having a negative attitude, you know, can majorly affect your business. And uh, so I've been posting stuff like Dick Pickler on there, how to do an effective sale. So we're going to focus on sales, that aspect of business as well, which, you know, I'm no expert at it, but we can learn from each other and, and listen to the, the legends out there. Um, but yeah, so Absolutely. I think, and, um, you know, I, I think drinking a Big B. Uh, is really important to keeping your health up. Well, it really is, especially the first one being filled with plastic. Yeah. Especially when you when you said, you know, I'm not going to eat bad for me. And I did my calorie count, Paul. You'd be really proud of me. I did my calorie count. And this only took me over by 300 calories. So only. <laughs> only I, o I only did 5,000 or 6,000 calories. What was your today? sodium intake? <laughs> what was your sugar intake? <laughs> Screw the Rather calories. What was the salted Don't. sugar intake? <laughs> hey, man, I mostly live on rock stars, so I'm good to go. Um, I'm joking. <laughs> um, but Tease Ball, who's on YouTube right now, he wanted to know why we didn't talk about the Van Duel sprayer. It's just because we forgot about it. It's not that we don't like Van or we don't like Best Steamer. He's a great guy. He makes a good sprayer. No knock against him. I just totally forgot to mention it as a good sprayer. I think it's a great sprayer. Thomas, please chime in. I used that sprayer today with Silver Solution in class. That's the sprayer we used. Robert was there. <laughs> so we used the Van Tool sprayer and Silver Solution, and we used Silver Solution in spotting on the wine stains in that as well. But we actually used that sprayer because it is a pretty good, and it's convenient. You know, it's battery-powered, and I – uh actually tweaked it and put all the good uh, clamps on it and changed the quick connect on the nozzle because I don't like those stupid air quick connects that he had on him and that. But overall, it's a pretty good sprayer, and I used it today. So I will give him a plug that I used it today. So I liked it, and the people who were in my class liked it. Yeah, I, I, I use the Van Tool sprayer from time to time. I, I personally like the Gintu sprayer a little better myself for carpet cleaning. If I have a full street clean, I like the Van Tool sprayer better. It's six to one, half dozen the other. But once again, guys, thank you so much for watching. I appreciate everybody out there in YouTube land and in Facebook land. It's been a great show. We had at, at, at the highest, we had 57 viewers at this um in this venture. So it shows that this is working out really good. I really appreciate everybody so much for watching and you know um it's like robert was saying you know remember how important it is to take care of your business and your family and to keep things in order and remember your liability but just like josh brought out keep in mind our health mental and physically when we're doing this um it, on a personal note if anybody's struggling out there make sure that they reach out to someone to get help we're all here for each other um we really do care and on that note, we're going to go ahead and sign out and just think it through.